I just started to feel rubbish about myself again, I started drinking, um, I was eating rubbish because I felt like crap. It becomes this loop that you just get stuck in. I think addiction does run in my family. My dad wasn't very old, he was in his 60s. He could have lived, you know, another 20, 30 years. And my brother, he was only 44 when he passed away. So seeing that was also a huge wake up call. So I just wanted to be healthy so that no one has to worry about me, that I can be there, I can be present for everyone and I'm not anxious all the time. I thought I looked as good as my photos looked, which- Amazing. Yeah, and I felt amazing seeing those photos. I was like, yeah, that is confirmation of I've actually achieved this. I've done what I set out to do. In terms of my relationship with alcohol, I did go away at the weekend with my family and I did have a drink, but I didn't go crazy. The fact now that I can go for a month, I can go for two months, I can go for three months without drinking is an achievement in itself. Okay, so Katie, take me back to uh, September, October last year, just before you started. Uh, what were the series of trigger moments that led you to uh, wanting to make a change and start your auntie journey? Um, I think there, was a, there were a few. Um, I'd, I just sort of, I just purchased a house, which was great. And that was like a really, really good thing. Um, and I'd been back living with my parents for a couple of months whilst I was waiting for my house to be ready. Um, and I think I just kind of found myself slipping back into old bad habits. I was drinking a bit too much, eating, eating a bit too much. Um, and then... I, I went on holiday and I think that kind of made it all a bit more uh, more worse because I was just eating more. As you do when you're on holiday, you kind of enjoy yourself a bit too much. And I got back and I felt absolutely rubbish. Um, so I I started you know, working out again, started going for runs. Um, I was doing Muay Thai at the time, which was great. I kind of got back into the swing of things. And then I think I just hit another sort of stumbling block I just started to feel rubbish about myself again. I started drinking um, most weekends. That kind of then started spilling out into the week. Um, I was eating rubbish because I felt like crap. And yeah, and I think I just kind of started to spiral and spiral and spiral. And I, and I just realized that I kind of hit my my limit then. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then I'd, I'd seen a couple of adverts for RNT on Instagram and the thing that I, I kind of, I saw from that was there was obviously the results, which looked amazing. Um, but I kind of wanted to then sort of learn a bit more about RNT. So I, yeah, I was just kind of doing a bit of information on that, um, bit of you know, sort of research. Um, and then, then yeah, I kind of, I, I reached out to, um, I can't remember who it was. I reached out to someone at RNT anyway, and then they got back to me. Amazing. So tell me about this uh, vicious cycle you're going through. You said that what, by what you explained, there seems to be a vicious cycle yeah. going through. What was the, what, what was causing this? I don't know. I think I've, I've, I've always suffered with quite low self-esteem. Okay. Um, and whilst I know what I should be doing to look after myself, you know, I should be eating healthily. I should be doing these things. I also, you know, really enjoyed having a drink at the weekend. But what I didn't realise for a very long time was drinking, you know, the next day you feel rubbish and that affects your mental health. And then you start to get really bad anxiety. And then from that, you then eat because you feel rubbish and you feel hungover. And and then it just, yeah, it just becomes this loop that you just get stuck in. Um, Where do you think this self-esteem uh, stem from? That's a good question. I think probably from maybe even from school. I I, I was quite low in confidence. I wasn't like the most uh, attractive looking kid. I was slightly overweight. Um, you know, I had friends. I wasn't bullied or anything like that. But I just I think I always felt like the ugly one in my group of friends. Um, and I think that kind of played its role. Um, and I think, yeah, even going into my adult life, I probably brought that with me a little bit. Um, so I think that's probably where where that stems from. And then what behaviour did that lead to? Is that Was that the, the, the trigger for the drinking? Yeah, I, I started, you know, I think back in the day, back in the the sort of early 2000s it was still quite normal for kids I don't think it is so much nowadays which is a good thing but kids my in my like circle we would drink at like the age of 14 we'd have like you know we'd go out and sneak our 
parents alcohol or whatever um so it was kind of that culture and I think that was another way to kind of suppress my feelings so to speak um so yeah it was that definitely didn't help things at what point did you think okay I'm drinking too much or I'm eating too much and this is sort of spilling from the weekends now to just day-to-day living um do you know what? I think there's been quite a few times in my 20s and in my 30s where I've known that what I was doing was wrong. I've kind of mm. corrected myself, gone through periods where I haven't been so crazy and so sort of over in, like overindulged. Um, but I've always then kind of got, got back into it. So that's where that's where I, I you know I you know I got to the age of 37 this year or last year now, and I was like I really do need to to do something. Where do you think that comes from, that, that that feeling of, I know what I'm doing isn't right, but I'm going to do it anyway? That's a really good question. And I still, I still don't, I still don't think I know the answer. I would love to know what that answer is. Um, I don't think it's helped probably that in my, my family, um, just as a sort of another side story to all of this, I, uh, I grew up with my brother, who was a really amazing person, but unfortunately he was uh, a, a drug addict. Um, and I think addiction does run in my family. One of my uncles was an alcoholic. So I don't know if, you know, addiction plays a role in that slightly. I, I really don't know, um, but probably didn't help. Is your, is your brother older than you? Uh, really? Yeah, he was older. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2019 oh. um, from... Uh, from just an accidental drug overdose uh, mixed with not being very well at the time. He had pneumonia and yeah, yeah. yeah just those things kind of uh, wow. took a toll. So what was the impact um, on your brother's sudden, sudden passing uh, on the family? Um, yeah, obviously it was it was a real shock. Um, in 2016, so a few years before that, my dad also passed away quite suddenly. Uh, he'd had his various issues over the years he'd also actually had a bit of a drinking problem towards the end of his life um but I think in terms of the the catalyst I think obviously it certainly did not help um but it also did help me in some ways I don't know if this is um you know well it definitely it, it did help me um kind of see well actually you know this isn't just this isn't just affecting, you know, the obviously the people that you love around you, um, you know, in a in a mental, mental in a in a way that's you know negative in you know how they feel. It's also a, a health thing as well, you know. Seeing both those people, you know, my dad wasn't very old; he was in his sixties. He could have lived, you know, another twenty, thirty years. And my brother, he was only forty. I think he was only forty-four when he passed wow. away. So, you know, I think seeing that was also a huge wake-up call uh, for me to kind of sort my sort myself out. Um, how did what was the what was the impact of your dad uh, passing on, on yourself and your brother? Did it make your brother's uh, addiction worse? Or I think it definitely didn't help. Um, you know, when my dad passed away, he left you know, a bit of money, obviously. Um, and that was, you know, a great thing because, you know, it's it's great obviously to have money to then be able to kind of, you know, do what you want with it. But obviously you'd rather have your, your parents there. Um, but unfortunately for my brother, that gave him more money to buy more drugs. Um, it also, he was very sad and upset that my dad had passed away. So I think those things certainly didn't help. And how did it impact you in that scenario? Um, it was quite difficult for me. I was the the one that kind of had to do all of the um, arrangements for his his you know his funeral. Um, I was the one that had to sort out all the financial side of things, mm-hmm. which was made even more difficult by the fact that my dad had moved to Spain and his passing. Was it was quite messy because obviously I didn't I wasn't fluent in Spanish so <laughs> things like you know like arranging um, to 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 get his body cremated that kind of stuff was was quite difficult to do we had to kind of rely on people out there that he knew to help us with translation and stuff like that um, and then we had to sell his house over there so all those things were were really difficult for me but actually 
in some ways it it really helped me because I kind of had to step up for my family um, and be the be the you know the more sensible one um, and I think that kind of was the catalyst for me to start sorting my life out a little bit more. You mentioned uh, addiction a few times now. Would you say you were addicted to alcohol? Yes. Um, though fortunately now I, I I don't you know I don't think I'm a, I think well actually I think people will always be addicts to things but I. I now know that I could easily not drink for three months and it'd be fine. But I do also do know that if I do drink, then the chances are that I will have, you know, more than two drinks. So that's kind of the trade-off. Um, so I would rather just not drink or, you know, if I am going to drink, then I know then that I'm going to probably have a couple of days where I feel like rubbish afterwards. <laughs> and what, what, is, what is it like having an alcohol addiction? What is, what does that actually look like um, on a day to day basis? For me, I think, you know, it's not like I, one of these people that would have to wake up, you know, wake up in the morning and has to drink anything like that. You know, I can go now for weeks and weeks and weeks and you know, even months from doing RNT, I know now that I can, you know, not drink for months, which is amazing. Um, but I think when it was really bad, I, I know a lot of people probably had a similar thing, but during lockdown, I did find myself drinking and it was getting earlier on, earlier on in the day that I was drinking, you know, go, oh, it's three o'clock, I'll, I'll, I'll have a drink. And there were times where I was probably drinking like, two bottles of wine a day at the worst the worst point of it which is mad looking back at it is that during lockdown yeah during lockdown um and then yeah i mean obviously you get to a point where you're just like oh I, I can't do this anymore so you stop you don't drink for a while but it's yeah it's it's when you do drink it's kind of that finding it so difficult to stop after one or two and i do have some times you know where i'll drink and i will only have one and i will only have you know, two. Um, but there's always that little thing inside your head going, oh, you can, you can have another one. You can have another one. It'll be really fun kind of thing. Um, but then, you know, the next day it's not really worth it. <laughs> so. And what's that conversation with the devil? It's like a, it's like yeah. the devil, right? What, what, are, what are they, what is he or she telling you? Um, what are you saying back to them? They're like, oh, you know, you have loads of fun. You're going to feel this like you're going to feel really crazy. You're going to have more um, more confidence to speak to whoever you want to speak to. Uh, it's going to be so much fun. You know, you're going to be up till late, but you're going to love it. You know, you'll be fine tomorrow. You're not going to feel sick. You're not going to feel like crap, you know. Um, but the reality is, obviously, the next day you do feel rubbish. And were these only in social situations? Was it on your own? Um, well, during Next. lockdown, it was on yeah, my own. Because <laughs> yeah. I was living on my own at the time. Um, I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't seeing anyone at the time. So I was, I was literally. I think the first few months of lockdown, aside from my neighbours who I saw over the fence, I was completely on my own, apart from like you know Zoom calls or whatever. Um, so that was definitely just drinking on my own. Um, and then that obviously was a really bad habit because you get used to drinking on your own and then it becomes the norm. So now actually that's the other thing um, is I, you know, if I do drink, it it will be in a social situation rather than on my own because, yeah, I think I think it's better to do that than drink on your own. <laughs> Did you ever seek support? No, I didn't. I, I mean, I've, well, I mean, I spoke to, you know, I spoke to my other half. I spoke to my mum about it. Um, actually, I did speak to my mum about it over last summer. I was like, I'm drinking too much. And she said, I know. <laughs> She's like, I've seen it. You're living with me. I can see that you're drinking too much. Um, what did she see? Well, she she knew that, I, you know, I was drinking like wine every evening. Um, some of that. And she was she was saying, you know, I can't tell you how to live your life, but you you seem quite sort of anxious the next day. So maybe maybe, you know, you should should think about not drinking so much. But obviously, you know, there's only so much you can say to someone, don't do something, um, especially when it's your parents, because, you, you know, you tend to kind of rebel against your parents. Was there ever like a rock bottom moment for you? There's probably been a few, but I can't really like think of any particular, you know, wow moments. I think actually, I think, yeah, probably like in September, I... There was one evening and I I did that was it I drank on my own. Um, my other half doesn't really drink, so it was it was just me and I think I drank 
I think I drank two bottles of Prosecco to myself, felt horrendous the next day. And I was like, yeah, I can't do this anymore. And, and I just felt so depressed, so sad. Um, but it was at a point where I wasn't, I wasn't drinking regularly at that point. I was only drinking once every couple of weeks, but it was just that feeling of, yeah, this needs to stop. I need to sort my life out. I need to start getting back into a routine where I'm making myself happy and I'm not making myself miserable. When you look back at your life and you said you've had periods where it's every few weeks, some periods where it's daily. Yeah. What have been like the commonalities or, or the what's been going on in your life that's caused you to drink more and then to have less? Yeah, that's a really good point. And actually, I think this kind of all goes back to, I don't really know what it is, but I do know that when I'm doing better, it's when I have a routine and when I have you know, I, I know what I'm going to be doing for the week. I'm going to the gym. I have a plan. And I find that when that plan is disrupted, I kind of, I don't really know how to control myself, I guess. So there's structure in it. Yeah. Lacking structure. Is it linked to work in, in that if you if you, things are going, if you have a focus at work, it helps you? Or have you found those two to be independent? Obviously, I do get stressed about work. That would be yeah. a lie to say I don't get stressed about work. Um, I think work does definitely give me a purpose. So, like, when I'm really, really busy with work, I actually I actually love it. I'm one of those people that loves to be busy. I love to be doing things. And actually, yeah, I think when I'm... I think that actually when I don't have things to do is when I self-destruct. Mm. So I think actually, yeah, there probably is an element of work there, but not in the sense of, oh, I'm stressed at work. You know, I'm going to have a drink. Um, it's probably the other way around. You know, I'm, I'm bored. I, I, I want to have a drink kind of thing. Do you think much about the, the Katie back at school? You said that that was a, mm. a key part of your sort of journey. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know. I think I was quite a different person back then. Um, I didn't. I didn't really enjoy school. I found it really difficult because I the, the subjects that I enjoyed, I was really good at. The subjects I didn't enjoy, I was really bad at, and I was quite naughty in the lessons. But I don't know if that's you know. I don't really know what that means in terms of adult me, other than the fact that you know. If I don't like doing something, I don't want to do it. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, you had this trigger moment around September, October that things need to change, and you saw you saw an ad on Instagram. Yes. Uh, what piqued your interest that this was the answer or this was the the solution to help you with your problems? So the thing that really drew me in was it wasn't a six weeks and you're going to get ripped kind of thing. It was an actual plan. It was a year plan. And it was also a program that where it isn't like, you know, oh, we're going to tell you everything's OK if you've overeaten today. I'm not saying that the trainers are mean. What I'm saying is they keep you accountable. They say to you, look, you know, if you're going to go and do this, then, you know, you're not going to get the results. So you need to actually focus, you need to, you know, knuckle down. And the other thing as well is the education piece. So there's so much education um, and there's even free stuff that you have online readily available. And from reading that and from seeing the amount of detail that goes into that, I thought to myself, well, it's not just amazing results. You've obviously got this, you know, whole long year long program, but you've also got all this education that's really well written. So it's obviously, you know, it's, you know, it's something worth investing in. And what were the what was the result you were looking for? Um, for me, I obviously, you know, I did want to achieve the, <laughs> the great board. I mean, who doesn't? Yeah. Um, but for me, the the biggest thing for me was actually partly uh, proving to myself that I could stop, you know, drinking for a good period of time and be fine with it. That was one of the things. Um, and also it was actually the consistency and the the routine. So having a routine, having a purpose um, was the other thing that I really wanted to, to get out of it. And what um, what were some of the problems you faced early on in the journey? So you, you started in cleaning the palate. The cleaning the palate phase was actually really enjoyable. Um when someone says to you, you know, you're going to eat the same things for, 
I can't remember how long is it? Two, two, weeks. two weeks, yeah. Um, you, a lot of people go, oh, that's really boring. But I was like, oh, I quite like this challenge. I like the fact that you're going to be like, you know, the same thing to test whether or not it does actually make you feel, you know, sick of, I don't know, white, white potatoes after two weeks. So I was, you know, that wasn't the challenge for me. I think the biggest challenge for me was I don't want to fail. I'm not going to fail. Um, so, you know, I have to keep myself accountable. And it was, you know, every day filling in, um, you know, filling in the the, the check-ins, making sure that I turned up, making sure that I went to the, you know, that I started, uh, start my day with my workout and, you know, ended it by ticking off, ticking off that list to say I've done everything. What, um, what had you tried before? Oh, I've tried, yeah. <laughs> I've tried all kinds of, yeah, I tried some of the fad. Size as it all, yeah. Yeah, some of those fad diets. I've done some of those, you know, six week, sh- like shred things. Um, they had varying results. I did quite well on one of them, a six week one. I did lose like quite a few kilograms, but at the end of it, that's it. You then just, you know, if you don't have anything else to do afterwards, you're just going to put the weight back on. And actually, I think I did it a second year. I did the same thing because it was like a Christmas thing and it was the same people back again. And I was like, well, you can obviously do it, but if you can't sustain it afterwards, what's the point? It's just, it's just a yo-yo diet at the end of the day. And why do you think you yo-yoed in the, in the past? Um, I think it was the psychological aspect of it. Mm. Um, definitely huge part in that. It's you get to a point, you've got to, you know, you've got to kind of a goal or you've got almost to a goal. But then what do you do after that? There's no real, there's no real structure. You can just stop going to the gym after that. And whilst I love, I love going to the gym, I'd never actually had like a, someone telling me, if you do this, but you actually stick with it for longer than six weeks. You keep doing, you keep doing it. You're going to see amazing results. It's always just been like, yeah, do this for six weeks and that's it. And then you go and start doing other, um, other training, or you know, you start doing hit or something else. Um, that was, yeah, that was the other thing I think that that kind of I'd never then stuck with it because I was always just going on to moving on to another plan and doing something else. When you started R&T, did you decide to not drink or yes. use intake? What was your decision around alcohol? Yeah. So the day before I started r and I had my last alcoholic drink, but I hadn't actually drunk for a couple of weeks before then anyway. So I just, I think I had, I had like two glasses of wine. I was like, this will be my last one because I'm not going to be able to drink for a, you know, a long time. going to see how I feel. Drank them. Then I was like... Oh, I already feel like rubbish. <laughs> that's that's not even like the next day. But once I kind of got into the swing of it and I'd done a few weeks, I was like, this is actually, I feel so much better already. Mm. And just, I think it's a, it's so much more, it's a psychological thing, obviously, but it's once you've got over that, you know, three, four weeks, it just becomes so much easier to not drink. It becomes so much easier when you're, you know, having to do something for work or you're having to, meet with friends um, that you would normally be drinking, it becomes so much easier just to say no, mm. um, which I'd never been able to do before. <laughs> and what was the reaction? Uh, yes, people found it quite weird because <laughs> they were like, yeah, but you sure you don't want a Prosecco? You normally have Prosecco or, you know, whatever. And I was just like, mm, no, I'm doing a challenge. You know, that's that's how it is. And they were like, oh, OK. <laughs> it's not as bad, right? When you yeah. Play. Okay, so you you started the process, found a routine through cleaning the palate. Yeah. What were the some of the obstacles you faced early on? Because you started at what's typically a difficult time to start, which is November. I think it's a great time to start, but it can pose some challenges. And a lot of people in November are like, oh, no, I'll start in January. How did you find that, especially with all the Christmas events? Yeah, so to begin with, I felt like I'd made a really bad choice. <laughs> I was like, why did I start then? I've got Christmas coming up. But actually, in hindsight, it was the best thing to do because... Yes, I did have like a couple of drinks over Christmas and New Year's. Um, but for that entire time when I normally would have gone probably out for you know, work drinks or, you know, God knows how, how many other sociable things that I would have normally have drunk, I didn't at all. Um, and I was also training, although unfortunately the week 
I think it was the week before Christmas, I got really sick and couldn't do anything aside from um, I couldn't even I couldn't even work. I was that sick. Um, but but yeah, I think actually um, starting in November was probably the best thing for me um, because it really challenged me. But it also set me up so well because, you know, my mental uh, my mental health got impacted in the best way possible because I found that I was so much more resilient and I didn't realise I was as resilient as as I actually am. Describe the first uh, win that you had. Um, the first win would definitely be the fir- getting through those first two weeks, you know, clean the palette. Um, actually, no, the first win I had was getting into um because I started doing the started with, with doing weights at home um and I was encouraged by Chris to to go to you know gym and actually you start using the the squat racks and I'd always I mean I had used squat racks before I you know my previous gym I did use them but I was never really one for going consistent consistently to the gym because I was always a bit self-conscious I think my biggest win actually was joining the gym and then going and actually doing every single training session in the gym and feeling absolutely fine and by the end of that first week not feeling self-conscious whatsoever and now I go to the gym all the time and I absolutely love it. Amazing what did you feel self-conscious about? Um, I think it's all those things that you think you think people are going to be judging you or looking at you and actually they really don't care (laughs) Um, so I think it was that. Um, I do still sometimes get you know if I'm starting a new um, so adding like hip thrusts into my routine um, I was using I was using just dumbbells before, but like learning how to use it with a barbell. First time you do it, it's a bit awkward and you feel a bit silly, but then afterwards you've done it a couple of times, you're absolutely fine. Yeah. yeah. So describe when you wanted to commit to a shoot. So you completed a shoot in March, was it? Yes. End of March. Uh, so you roll into the new year, decided to commit to a, you, you joined the the shoot challenge mm. group that we had. Yeah. What made you want to do that? Um. I have always, I've always, it's one of those things, I don't really like having my photo taken, but at the same time, I was like, if I'm going to commit to this and I'm going to do this year transformation, I want to do the shoot because I want to get the best results possible. And what better way to get better, though, the best results possible than committing to something where you're going to be, you know, your your picture could potentially be everywhere. So you've got to do, you've got to do your best. Um, so yeah, that's that's why. Um, I was slightly nervous once I'd signed up. I was like, oh, you know, I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. But no, I was I was so happy that I that I did sign up for it because um, it just gave me even more focus to to push on and and you know and continue to commit to everything. And let's talk about the, the that twelve week period then of of going from cleaning the palette, start familiarizing yourself with the process. Then it's like right, I'm locking myself into my first checkpoint. What were some of the the biggest challenges in that period, and what did you learn about yourself? I think the biggest challenges were um, the days where I did crave. You know, there are days. You know, you could be doing so well in all aspects of your life, but especially being a woman, when you're due on, um, you do crave rubbish food from time to time. Um, and at, actually at the beginning, you know, when you're on the higher calories, it's not so bad because you're getting the nutrients from elsewhere. And so the days that you do crave sugar or, you know, or something a bit bad, you normally it's okay. But as the shoot progressed and the calories got lower, it was really difficult. And there were days where you just kind of, you want to pack it all in and you just want to, you know, eat a whole pizza to yourself. <laughs> but it's knowing that if you do that, then yes, okay, it wouldn't be the end of the the world, but also you're not going to get the results that you've signed up for, that you've worked so hard for up until that point. So it was definitely that, that mental game with your, with again, that little devil on your shoulder saying, you know, oh, you could have pizza or, you know. <laughs> I think that was, yeah, that was probably the most difficult bit. You said like, the results are like what really drove you. Mm. But what was the why behind the results? Like what was you, what were you trying to what were you trying to prove to yourself with these results? So I think there's there's a couple of things. Um obviously the 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 why for me um was around being there being being healthy so that no one ever has to worry about me because obviously, you know, 
with the drinking and stuff like that, people did get quite worried about me at some point. So I'm not saying that like I was ever someone that it was drinking at seven in the morning and couldn't hold down a job because it, I, it wasn't like that. Um, but I didn't want my mum, especially, you know, with going through having lost her her son, her eldest child, um, and whilst my parents were to get, weren't together, um, she's she remarried a very long time ago. Um, she did also have to pick up the pieces when my dad passed away, um, look after us. So I just wanted to be someone that was healthy so that no one has to worry about me, um, that I can be there, I can be present for everyone and I'm not, you know, anxious all the time. Um, so that was that was really important to me. Um, so that's, I think that that's part of it. Just trying to think of, of other reasons why. Um, I think that's probably, that's probably the main thing. Um, because, yeah, I mean, obviously I wanted to look great, but I also want to you know, feel better mentally, I guess, as well. And that was from the anxiety. Yeah. Feeling anxious in your days. Yeah. Um, and I, I also, you know, I struggled with my weight growing up. I was quite overweight at points in my life, especially as a teenager, and then at some points in my 20s. And I think that really impacted me as well. Um, you know, going back to that kid at school that always felt like the chubby one, um, I wanted to kind of feel like I, you know, I could finally achieve that body that I've always wanted to have. Um, so I think that was, yeah, that was another another catalyst for it. Amazing. And on the route to your checkpoint, the final sort of four to six weeks or when, you know, you go from good to great, you yeah. really have to push yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find that period? Um, it's a really strange period, but I have to say we had a little WhatsApp group going for our shoot. And because we had, you know, I can't remember how many in our group there were, there's about 10, 12 of us. Um, because we're all you know, going for the same thing. We had that accountability, but we also had that support so we could talk to each other about how we're feeling. I know there were some days where, um, you know, like uh, someone would, would message and say, look, I'm not feeling great today. I just want to eat. I just want to eat a whole cake to myself kind of thing. Um, I just appre really appreciate some words of encouragement. And everyone would just like message and say, look, you've got this. I know you feel rubbish today. You feel like crap, but you know, tomorrow's a new day. You've just got to keep pushing on. Um, the I think the one of the hardest things actually, and I think this was for everyone in my group, especially was the, um, the tight, the, the la so you're so tired, but you also struggle to sleep towards the end because your body's so like yeah, yeah. hungry. <laughs> So you're knackered, but you're also like basically an insomniac for like the last week or two. Um, I think that was probably is the that, Is that you, did you experience that? Yeah, I was so, I was like absolutely wired, but at the same time really tired. Yeah, that's weird. Everyone responds differently to the sleep thing. Some people can Some get people impacted can sleep, like that. Yeah. I'm one of those guys who just knocks out even more. <laughs> yeah. I'm sleeping even more at the end. Oh, no, no, my sleep was really impacted. Um, I think that was, yeah, that was the hardest bit. And then what was it like uh, at the photo shoot itself? The photo shoot, I thought I was going to be really nervous. I was going to be like n worried and really awkward. And I guess for like the first 10 minutes, you are a bit awkward. Yeah. But I weirdly really enjoyed, like I really started enjoying it about, about half an hour in. I was like, this is great. This is fun. I was like, oh, look, my tan looks like, my fake tan looks great right now. Um, and it did help as well that I was able to have like a few Haribo in between. Yeah. Um, a few like gummy sweets. I think that also perked me up a bit. Um, but yeah, it, it's amazing how actually how fun it is how fun a shoot is, which I never thought I'd say. I thought it was going to be like cringing throughout, but it wasn't like that at all. And I think um, the Simon who did my photos, he's just such a lovely guy. So it just, it just made it so much easier. How did it feel looking at yourself in the pictures when he was showing you on the camera? I'm assuming he was, or yeah. you know, seeing yourself in the mirror? Yeah, so I know um, quite a few people in my cohort said that they couldn't believe it was them. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the photos I could believe it was me because I did actually like I thought I looked as good as my photos looked 
um, which amazing. Yeah, and and I felt amazing. And just seeing those photos, I was like, yeah, that is confirmation of I've actually achieved this. I've I've done what I set out to do. Um, yeah. And how did that make you feel in the context of your why? It was, it's honestly, I I still think about that day and it was like one of the best days ever. It's like I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve. Um, I've done, actually, I've, I've overachieved what I thought I could mm. do. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just like the best day. And then after that, I went for dinner with my other half and, you know, I didn't go crazy. I did have, I did have a dessert, obviously, because I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a robot. <laughs> But yeah, it was, it was honestly, it was, it was, it was just, it was just a, like a wow moment for me. And how have you found, uh, sort of the post checkpoint period? So consolidation, investment, yeah. losing the sort of pedestal of the shoot. Yeah. It's really difficult. The first, the first. This is the first time you've had like support around yeah. like, the weight loss, right? It, the first couple of weeks, you kind of feel like you you've had all of this hype you've achieved it but then it's like what what do I do now and obviously the coaches are on hand and they're amazing and they're you know they're really supportive but it is really difficult because you do feel like you've you've done all of this stuff to look a certain way and then it's like what do you do after that but once you then switch to um so there's obviously lots of routes you can go down but I've gone for you know thinking towards like a performance goal um obviously I want to maintain like a lean physique but I also want to um you know progress in my my weightlifting um I've also signed up to do the half marathon this year I did a marathon a couple of years ago nice. which one's that um I'm doing the Ealing half oh nice yeah, yeah I'm signed up to it as well <laughs> yeah um it's a tough one, that one. It's a sneaky one. Yeah. That's, Have you done it before? No, I've never done it. I did the London Marathon in 2022. Oh, and yeah, yeah. that was, that was amazing. How did you get on with that? I, I did it, but it was really difficult. I did, I, I did train, obviously, but I don't think I, I, I don't think I trained as well as I could have done. Um, so this time is all about, it's not about like getting a crazy fast time or anything like that. It's just about doing it, finishing it, but also feeling great once I've finished mm. it. So that's my that's my goal. So that's like one of my goals, my performance. Feeling great after a half marathon. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that's possible, but <laughs> but not because yeah, yeah, uh, like uh, the the London Marathon, I really hurt my hip. Yeah. And so for the last, it was I think it was the last six, the last nine miles, I was like li like running with a limp. Oh, it was so horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. The eating one's a sneaky one because as I did it last year. Yeah. Thinking. Oh, everywhere I live around uh, Ealing is all flat. So I was thinking, oh, it's be a nice flat race. And I was telling, um, I was telling someone on the team who also did it with us, Shreta. I said, oh, it's an e it's a Ealing's easy. So like, it's all flat. But yeah. I didn't do any of my research, right? And literally, it was just up and down the whole way. Oh, it was no. pain. <laughs> <laughs> I was so shocked by it as well. Every time I saw another hill, I was like, how is this? Where are these hills coming from? I feel like it's. I feel like Have West Ealing well? is going to be like the sneaky bit because yeah. that is quite. Yeah. Have you heard that from other people? Then? No, okay. I haven't heard that. I'm so now, be prepared. <laughs> I'm now quite nervous. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, it's a good race. Though. It's a good day out. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And it's nice that it's going to be so close to my house as well. <laughs> Just yeah, to, yeah. to run around. Amazing. Uh, how's the physical been the vehicle for you? It really is. I I know people say that you when you exercise you feel better. It's it is true. You 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 don't just feel it in your body. You feel it mentally. Um, like I said before, I like having a routine. So having a routine that I can stick to every day. You know, I go into the gym, I do, you know, I lift lift the weights and I feel so much better afterwards. So it it really is, it really is, it really is everything, I think, um, the physical being the vehicle. Amazing. And if someone's listening to this thinking, you know, I've been listening to RNC for a while, I'm not sure whether I should try it. What, why should they invest in something like this? Um, because it's not a you know a quick quick fix. It is a it's a you know you're committing to a year for one, um, but also you're getting so much support. Um, and I know that some people may think you know oh it's it's expensive, but actually I was speaking to my friend, uh, speak to a couple of my friends um, who I had over recently because it was my other half's birthday, and they were saying actually for for what you're getting, it's it's nothing. 
because you're getting all of that support. It's things like submitting your you know your videos each week um, for your your different lifts that you're doing and getting the feedback on you know where you need to improve. I can I know that I can message my I can I can message Chloe at any time and be like look I'm really struggling and she'll come back to me and she'll tell me you know all the things that I need to hear. Um, she'll tell me to, to you know to sort myself out, <laughs> um, but she'll also be you know really supportive at the same time. And those things you you don't get from other programs, uh, not that I've seen anyway. Amazing. And what almost kept you from joining? Um, I think you know initially it's that okay, well you know I'm going to be paying this much each month. Um, what if it doesn't work? So that's always going on in your head. But then I think you know seeing that you you trained. With Samir, you know he's a good guy. Um, so that that, shout that out made to me, Samir. yeah, shout out to Samir. That made me trust you. So yeah. amazing, amazing. Uh, and if someone's at the early stages of their journey, what would you say to them right now? What's what's the piece of advice you give them? Um, I would say that momentum, just keep it. Do not think that you know you're doing great now you can you can let off you can let yourself go a bit you need to just keep that momentum going because the more you keep the momentum going the more you're going to get amazing results at the end and the more it's going to help you when you do have those days where you feel like crap <laughs> amazing what's uh, what's next for for Katie then and uh on a final note just sort of loop it all back what's your relationship with alcohol now so next for me um is i i want to I want to obviously carry on at the gym. I'm really enjoying that. I want to keep that routine going. I that literally now just that's that is my life and I really love it. I know people don't don't always love exercise or they do because they feel like they have to, but for me it's it's now like that's like my therapy. You know, like some people go to therapy for things. My therapy is going to the gym in the morning. Um, so definitely want to keep up that momentum, want to get some PBs in the gym, um, obviously do the Ealing Half Marathon. In terms of, yeah, my my relationship with alcohol, I still think there's probably areas I can improve and like I would love to get to a point where I just have the one drink and that's it. Um, and I am I am getting there, definitely. I've, you know, I, I did go away at the weekend with my my family and I did have a drink, but I didn't go crazy. Um, so just little things like that. I want to just keep improving that. But I think the fact now that I can, you know, I can go for a month, I can go for two months, I can go for three months without drinking is an achievement in itself. Yeah, it's huge. And even just what you just said there, being able to go away, have one or two drinks, yeah. not go crazy is, is probably a massive win and you also, look back three years ago. Yeah, and also with the food as well, like I because I really struggled with like binge eating when I was younger, um, that was probably another thing that I didn't mention, which was very important. I used to binge eat terribly when I was younger um, and, I, and I still did up until the point of RN, like starting R&T. So now, uh, you know, we went away at the weekend. We went on a like a mini cruise, um, nice. which was it was quite an experience. Um, but you know, there's obviously buffets there. There's all the food that you could possibly want. There's literally food bars, everything. Every you know, mm. every room you go into, there's more food. And I was going there, and I was you know having my breakfast. I might have had like one of those little mini croissants, but the rest of my meal was just like eggs bit of toast and it was all really balanced and then in the evening we went out again you know I was having fish and I was having vegetables and, and a bit of you know potatoes or whatever everything's now more balanced which is yeah absolutely huge for me what was um t tell me what is this uh, binge eating because you didn't mention it too yeah much, but... I, I didn't really think about it I think I was I was focusing on the alcohol um but yeah, I used to I used to just eat my feelings all the time. That was another thing. I think I, I you know, I've always used food and alcohol have been the two things that I've always used whenever I've not felt great about myself or about things going on in life. So they've always been like the comfort blanket, I guess. And how does it happen? That walk me through a an um, episode, so to speak. Yeah, so it would normally be that again, that kind of little devil on your shoulder day's not going well you might have um I don't know I might have not had the best I don't know the best conversation with with my partner or at work or whatever 
And then I'll just think to myself, oh, you know, I could really just, I could really just go and hammer a packet of um, chocolate, um, like some chocolate buttons or something. And and then it's just that you're just thinking about it all the time, all day, just thinking about the chocolate. And then you know, before I would have snapped and I would have just gone down, had you know, gone and bought some chocolate, then gone and bought something else, and then just just sat there and just ate the whole lot, and then feel like rubbish afterwards. Um, Whereas now I don't feel the need to do that, which oh, is. And what do you think has changed there? What, because what, what, that sounds like when you said like, I'm thinking about it all day long, yeah, waiting to hammer that bag of chocolate. It's like you're trying to fill something, right? Yeah. What, what do you think has changed in your life? I think now, I, I think it's, I feel more, I feel more stable. I feel more balanced. Um, I think you know I've got this really nice life that I've built up over the last few years. And it's grounded me as as a person. And I don't need to do these, you know, I don't need to binge eat to feel better. Um, I think a lot of the tools as well you learn with RNT around, you know, you know, not just learning the why behind your why, but there's lots of articles around binge eating and how to help yourself and kind of, you know, going back to your going back to your why helps you kind of think, well, you know, why why am I gonna eat this whole thing of chocolate? If I do that, What's it going to solve? It's not going to make me feel better. Yeah, it might make me feel better for 20 minutes, but in an hour, I'm going to feel rubbish. Um, yeah. And what did you, when you had that urge during the process, what conversation would you have with yourself to keep yourself on track? I just, you know, I just had to keep reminding myself that I've come this far. You know, mm. if I do this, then it's just, it's a slippery slope to then letting that, compulsive behavior back into your life so I think it was the fear of letting myself get back into that pattern um really stopped me from doing it um and then also the support as well having people to speak to um you know having Chloe having Chris to speak to about these things they would they'd do I mean I did have a slip up I did have one slip up um and I spoke to and I spoke to them about it and they were like look you know it's it's obviously it's happened. You can't do anything about it, but you just need to think about the next time. You know, mm. if this happens, reach out to me before you before you take the action. Speak to us; we'll be able to help you. Which was another really um, really great thing about R and T. You've been really uh, open with your story, and it strikes me as someone who's very self aware. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> which is which is really good. Do you um, have a lot of these realizations? about your habits and your past sort of triggers, have they come to you recently or have you always been aware of sort of some of these loops and cycles you've been, I've been in and trying to break? The last couple of years I've been aware of the loops, but I've never really been able to close them. And I think doing, doing the RNT has finally helped me to close a lot of those loops. I'm not saying I'm perfect. You know, there's yeah. always going to be days where things happen, but I'm, I would say I've gone from being pretty much a 50 50 person to now being like a you know like a 90 10 or 95 5 person um definitely and, and and why like what why is it about this process i think it's because i've proven to myself that i can do it um and also because of the the support and i and i think as well just before doing all of this, I was really honest. Like I spoke to my mum about a lot of the things that I was struggling with. I spoke to my other half about them. And that also kind of, I think when you vocalise things, yeah. that really helps. And what do they say when you, especially like your other half who's living with you, what did he say to you? Um, she was really like supportive um, and just really, yeah, just really, really supportive. Um, no judgment whatsoever um which which was nice you know it's always nice to to not you know to be able to go to someone and say something and then just say look you know it's it's not great you're feeling that way but I'm here you know if there's anywhere I can support you I will um, and they've been so supportive throughout my you know my RNT process I know some people did struggle a little bit with their families and mm. getting on board with the the fitness and the you know the healthy eating because I know for a lot of people, especially with kids, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> like, um, you know, having having it such a, especially during the shoot phase towards the end where you've got that yeah. really controlled diet, 
I know some people fa- have had to go to like family events and then, you know, were saying, you know, oh, you, you're you taking this too far, blah, blah, yeah, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Just not being so understanding. Whereas I think I was really fortunate because my other half was just like, yeah, it's fine. I didn't care. Like you eat what you need to be. I'm going to eat whatever I want. You know, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't bother me. So. For people struggling with addic- addictive behaviours, how important is it to vocalise and how do you encourage people to... I think to go through that. Yeah, it, it's so difficult. And I think most people suffer in silence. And actually mm. the the best thing to do is to speak to someone. Um, or if you can't speak to someone, write it down. Because I think it's that vocalising or at least if you write it down, then it's out there and it's not just living in your head. Um, and I think that's really important. Is that something you were doing a lot of before, just living in your head? Yeah, living in my head, um, not not actually being able to admit to it. Mm. Um, whereas now, I, I can. That's really interesting. Like mm. being able to admit to it and that yeah. acceptance. Yeah. What at what stage of the journey? I'm trying to get a a picture of like the timeline. What stage of the journey did you think? Right, there's an actual problem here. I think. Well, I think I always knew there was a. Well, I didn't always know there was a problem, but I think the last couple of years, especially. Um, I would say probably from like 2022. Okay. I knew there was a problem. Then obviously last year, I'd I'd gotten so much better. Like I wasn't drinking. I, you know, I, I was going for long periods where I weren't, wasn't really drinking. Um, you know, I'd go three weeks without drinking. I'd be like, oh, that's really good. Um, and then, yeah, and then when obviously I moved back to my, my parents, it was... The, you know, you go you go back to stay with your parents. It's I was really excited about it because I actually, unlike a lot of people, I love I love I love my family and I actually really enjoyed staying with them. Um, but I kind of got a bit carried away with like the whole oh it's exciting let's have a let's have a prosecco let's you know yeah. let's have a bottle kind of thing <laughs> and it just kind of spilled out and then I realised I was like yeah I'm kind of now using the fact that. I'm here and I'm having a good time. Is now it's now it's becoming a bit of an excuse. Like we don't need to be drinking every evening. Um, so I think that was yeah that was like the the real turning point for me. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing your story, Kay. Really appreciate your honesty and look forward to seeing your journey continue. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm looking forward to you know finishing off this year really strong. Amazing. 